to work together for your good. Plus more. Wow. 
Then he multiplies the seed as we saw it, so that the harvest of your generosity will grow. You'll be able, well, you'll be abundantly enriched in every way as you give generously on every occasion. For when, we, for when we take gifts to those in need, it causes many to give thanks to God. The priestly ministry you are proudly through your offering, you are providing through your offering, not only supplies what is lacking for God's people, it inspires an outpouring of praises and thanksgiving to God himself. So as we give this morning, we trust God that all things are telling and are working for our good. We trust that all our needs are met and nothing shall befall us, nothing shall by any means hurt us. Even if they say there is a third way, nothing, no third way for us. I worship you with my offering. I worship you with my seed and I trust that I will have a great harvest and I will advance your kingdom. So let's give him with generosity so that we can have an extravagant uh, harvest. Lord, we thank you this morning. We thank you for grace upon grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your goodness, Lord. We thank you that you have given us a share for your glory. We thank you that you have given us, Lord, a blessing that adds no sorrow. Yes, we thank you, Lord, as we give today, as we give this morning, Lord, as we give to your kingdom, we trust and believe in you. We say, Abba, Father, we trust you without any reasoning. We thank you for supplying all our needs according to your riches and glory. We thank you that you are making all grace to abound towards us. We thank you, my Father. We bless you. We give you all the glory in the name of Jesus. Amen.
And I'm going to read three translations for you, and then we will get out, kind of break it out for you. Now, the New King James Bible says this, <clears throat> And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I want you to highlight that. Since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believe and therefore speak. We also believe and therefore speak. See that? Paul speaking to the church in Corinth. He says, we have the same spirit of faith according to what is written. In other words, it is written already. I believe and therefore speak. He says, we also, we have the same spirit, that same spirit of faith. We have it. And because that same spirit of faith is in accordance with what is written, we also believe. And therefore, we also speak. The New Living Translation says this, but we continue to preach. I like that. We continue to preach. To preach means to proclaim, it means to declare. In this sense, it means speaking what you believe. See that? But we continue to speak what we believe. We continue to preach because we have the same kind of faith that the psalmist had when he said, I believe in God, so I speak. Now, who is that psalmist? That psalmist is David. He's saying that faith that David had, you and I have. You with me? That faith that David had, David's faith rested in God. That's why he said, I believe in God. Therefore, I speak. I speak what I believe. And what I believe, I believe God. I'm speaking God to my situation. The Amplified says, Yet we have the same spirit of faith as he had. We have the same spirit of faith as David had, who wrote in Scripture, I believe, therefore I spoke. I believed, therefore I spoke. That is Psalm 116, verse number 10. It says, I believed, therefore I spoke. We also believe. Therefore we also speak. You see, ladies and gentlemen, the brothers and sisters in Christ, faith is a spirit. That's why Paul said we have the same spirit of faith. If we go to the book, of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter number 10. And I'm going to read from verse 38. It says, Now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back. See that? We are not of those who draw back to perdition. But of those who believe to the saving of the soul. We are of those who believe in Jesus. We are of those who believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. We are of those who believe that Jesus died and he rose again. And because he rose again, God will raise us up together with him. That is what we believe. And that is what we speak. It means that there's no tomb or grave big enough to bury me because I died with Christ, I'm risen with Christ, and I'm seated together with Christ in heavenly places. It means there's nothing that anybody can say to keep me from rising. Come on, talk to me. 
If we partake of his, of his death, we partake too of his resurrection. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. Then he goes on to he goes on and he says, Now faith is the substance. Faith is the substance of things hopeful. In other words, faith is now. In other words, I am a now person, Lord Jesus. The writer of Hebrews was talking about the just living by faith, that we are not of those who draw back, but we are of those who believe to the saving of the soul. And then he goes on to say, now faith is. Now, what he's saying is, faith has now become to us. The substance. The substance. Substance, the Greek word hypostasis, means the foundation. Faith is the foundation. Faith is the starting place. Faith is the setting. Oh, Jesus. Faith is that which places under. You see, whatever you are facing, the minute you take a step of faith, when you're operating faith, you're taking that thing that's in front of you and you're putting, you subject, you are subject, subjecting it to faith. So faith places that thing under your control. Faith places that thing under your authority. Look at Moses. Moses had to go to Pharaoh. It was a step of faith. Yet to go to the leader in Egypt, the Pharaoh of Egypt. I mean, how many soldiers did Pharaoh have? Yet Moses went by faith. And just by going in faith, his faith subjected Pharaoh. His faith placed Pharaoh under his control. It means his faith overrode Pharaoh's authority. Come and talk to me. He says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. It means whatever I am hoping for, you understand what I'm hoping for, what I'm trusting God for, what I'm believing God for. You see, now faith takes whatever I'm facing and brings it under control. I'm it brings it to subjection of what God has shown me, of where God is leading me to. Are you getting that? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is evidence. It means that, sorry brother, can you pass me my jacket please? I want to show you something. Joshua, you see, when, how does faith come? Romans 10, 17 tells us, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. And we just read now, since we have the same spirit of faith according to what is written, you see, what is written has given me faith. You see, according to what is written. So in other words, you read what is written and faith came. And now faith, you see, faith creates an image, a picture. That only you, the, the recipient, the possessor of faith, the possessor of that word, only you see. The world around you cannot see it. Right? You get that? In other words, you see the inside of this jacket. You cannot see it. But he can see it. It is evidence to him. It is a reality to him. But to you, it's not a reality. You can't see it. So you don't understand it. You don't know what is seen. Now that's what faith is. That he will go according to what he sees, not according to circumstances. Thank you. That is what 
God said to you. You are a man of faith. You are a woman of faith. You see, as I be, become a talk to me, the psalmist David, listen, David, we know David was, man, he was a worshiper. He was a man after God's heart. Hence, you find that there's quite a number of psalms which were written by David. That means David was a writer. David was a writer. Solomon, his son, who took the throne after him, was a writer. Moses was a writer. Paul was a writer. Peter was a writer. You and I ought to be writers. You ought to be a writer. Habakkuk, let's go there quickly. Habakkuk ch chapter number 2. Habakkuk chapter 2. Just after the book of Nahum in the Old Testament. Habakkuk. When you there, you say amen. Right. Habakkuk 2, verse number 2. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision. See that? The Lord answered. In other words, the Lord spoke. And what did the Lord say? Write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. Write the people to Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Isaiah 8, verse 1. Moreover, the Lord said to me, Take a large scroll and write on it with the man's pen. You see that? Take a large scroll and write on it with the man's pen. Habakkuk is, is saying here, write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. The vision yet is for an appointed time. There's an appointed time. Let me tell you, that's why we encourage you when you come to service, come with your Bible, come with a notebook, come with a pen. Because why? When you do that, listen, you are demonstrating, listen, you are the writer of your life. Whatever you write, you are writing your life. You are sitting in a service and God is speaking word. God is giving you word. As the service is going on, the words that are coming, you start writing down what God is confirming with your spirit. You are writing it down. It's important to write. Listen, there's a Chinese philosopher named Confucius. He was a Chinese philosopher and politician. And he had this, there's a specific thing that he believed in, was I hear and I forget. You see, because it's not easy for you to absorb the entire message of a service through hearing. That's why you've got to write it down. Because I hear and I forget. I see and I remember. See that? That's why you write it down. He says here that he may run who reads it. When you read, you see. So he said, I hear and I forget. I see and I remember. I do and I understand. The understanding comes through doing. You know, early in my working career, I spent years in the retail. Uh, business and I worked for a company named Hellerine Holdings which became the largest furniture retailer in South Africa 
And that company was started by two Jewish brothers who came from Israel. And all they had was a suitcase and the money their mother had sent them. And as they, were, as they got off the train, and this is the story from Eric Lerie himself, they got off the train, and then they realized they need to get stuff in order for them to try and set up home. They walked past a second-hand shop. They walked in. They saw a wardrobe. They bought it for their clothes. Then they thought, how are we going to take this home? They saw a wheelbarrow. They put it on the wheelbarrow. And they pushed it. And as they were pushing it, somebody saw them. And somebody asked, are they selling it? And at what price? And Eric and Sydney conversed and quickly they responded and they made the price higher than what they had paid. And they saw that through doing that, you can make money, you can make a living. And they started their first furniture shop, it was called Station Furniture, down in Jerusalem. And he based his business, he, burst, he built his business empire on that belief and that system. I hear and I forget. I see and I remember. I do and I understand. Come and talk to me, somebody. Now, what I'm trying to get across is that, yes, we hear the word of God. But when you're faced with circumstances, you forget what you heard. That's why you've got to write it down. So that when it is written down, and you're faced with circumstances, what you do, you run and you go look for what you wrote. Because what did you write? You wrote words. Where did the words come from? From God. God, come on, God convinced your spirit, convicted your spirit, spoke to your spirit. God is spirit. We just heard it. Sister Lord Sashirina God is spirit. Those who worship God must worship Him now in spirit. When God speaks to you and God to the mind but the spirit understands so he says write the vision and make it plain on tablets I want to encourage you daily write down what God is saying you know we grew up in school I remember we had a subject called scripture and we would often you know you take out your notebook and the teacher would quote and you write down scripture now back then it didn't make sense, but now it makes sense to me that what I was writing, as I was writing the word, I was actually writing the story of my life. When each of us are born, you see a newborn baby is given this, a blank sheet, a new life, a new leaf. And all the events of life begin to write that story. But the thing is, as long as you do not write, you are allowing the things that are happening around you to write the story of your life and dictate the end of your life to you. Come on, talk to me. The Bible says that the Lord, He is God. Declaring the end from the beginning. So you see, when God speaks to you, God is telling you about your end. That's why when you live your life, don't live your life based on where you're at. You are in transition. Transition means movement. You are moving towards something. You're moving towards a glorious future. You're moving towards a good ending. It's not the end of the story. I don't what problem came your way? Yes, there may be a problem, and there may be another one. Come on, you can be like Job this morning. Come on, Job lost his children, and then they came to listen. They were telling him, Listen, Job, you lost your cattle, you lost your livestock, Job, you lost your children, Job, you lost everything. In all of that, Job upheld his integrity. His wife even came to him and said, Man, why don't you just curse God and die? And he said, You silly woman, don't. 
worship him. Though he slay me, I will serve him. Because I know that God has me covered. I know that God is in control. God, come on, he's the author of my life. He's the author of my life. And when I'm writing down, I'm writing down what the author is saying about my life. I'm writing it down on paper. You know, you can ask Pastor Sharon this. Sometimes I think I'm really irritated and I think it's very difficult. Kind of having to put that with me. Because she'll be asleep. And I'll probably be, you know, at my desk. Or probably in the sitting room. And the Lord will give me a word. Sometimes I'm just coming out of the shower. And the Lord will give me a word. I dry myself quickly and I run to the room. I race to the room. At night I run to the room, I'll put the light on. And I'll look for something to write on. Or even in the morning I'll wake up and the first thing I look for is something to write on. Because God has given me a word, something that I write down. Sometimes I'm speaking to Pastor Roshan, my spiritual father, or Pastor Zubayda, my spiritual mother. I'm speaking to them. For they sent me a, a message. I take the book, I take the page, and I write down. I'll show you why just now. You'll see the importance of that. It's scriptural. It's important that you write down. Don't allow, listen, if you are not writing down the story of your life that God has, that God has spoken and declared to you, to your spirit, and God has shown you that you see it with your spiritual eye, you see it with the eyes of the spirit, you see it through the eyes of faith. If you are not writing that story, then you are allowing society, the world, and its people to do it with your behalf. When you write down, no matter what people say about you, no matter what circumstances try to dictate to you, you go and visit what you wrote down. And you start speaking what you've written down. You see, he says, write down the vision. Write the vision. Make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. It means that there's times in your life that adversity will come and visit you. Our lives are not, come on, we are, we are not, oh, we do not live our lives free of adversity. An evil day will visit every individual. An evil day will visit. But when that evil day visits, you have something that you have written down that you can speak to your day. That you say what God has said. And when I'm saying that, I'm speaking my future and I'm bringing it to existence. I'm speaking it by faith. And remember, faith, faith subjects what I see to be under the authority of what God has shown me. That he may run who reads it. It means that you live your life. You get, you get to times in your life where you are tired, where you feel that you are drained, you have no strength. Sometimes you're lost for words, you don't know what to say. Or sometimes you know you want to pray, but you can't pray, you don't know what to pray. But listen, brothers and sisters in Christ, the Bible says the Holy Spirit Himself makes intercession on our behalf with groanings that cannot be uttered. You are there in your prayer closet. You want to pray, but you don't know what to say. You're just groaning in your spirit. Mm. 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 Because now, it's, you understand, the word that is within you starts working. And when you go and you take what you've written, and you start reading it, all of a sudden you regain your strength and you start running. Because that's what heaven can say. That he may run who does what? Who reads it. You see, you're hearing the word now. When you go out of this place, there's a lot of things that happen.
So much so that you forget what you heard. But if you've got it written down somewhere, you can always go and see what is written. You go and see what is written. And as you see what's written, you start picking up your pace and you start running your race. Understand? Are you hearing me, somebody? That he may run who leads him. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. The Bible encourages us. It encourages us. Amen. To continue doing good. Do not grow weary in doing good. For in due time, the Bible says in due time, there's something that's marked on the calendar of God's calendar. There's a due time. Everything that God has declared to you, there's a due time for it. Say amen to you. The vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end, it will speak and it will not lie. The vision will speak. Hallelujah. Ezekiel, I want to read something to you from Ezekiel 12, verse 24. The Lord says, For no more shall there be any false vision or flattering divination within the house of Israel. For I am the Lord, I speak, and the word which I speak will come to pass. It will no more be postponed, for in your days, O rebellious house, I will say the word and perform it, says the Lord God. We serve a God who is a performer of His Word. Everything that God has said, it will come to pass. It will come to pass. It will come to pass. One thing I read in the scripture from Genesis to Revelation that God says something and you go another chapter, another chapter, another chapter, then you find, you know, you go to another book and you go chapter, 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 another book, chapter, 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 and then it says, and it came to pass, as was spoken in that book. It came to pass. The Bible is loaded with accounts of it came to pass. It came to pass. What has God promised you? What has God said to you? What has God shown you? It's coming to With me. He goes on in Habakkuk. He says, At the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, though it takes time, wait for it. Paul tells us, Let patience have a perfect work. Be patient. Relax. To the young children, chill. Relax, relax. Don't look like because then we have problems. You with me? Relax, not look like. Relax. Look like has adverse effects. You sit on another throne. But when you relax, you remain focused. You are waiting.
God is coming for you. It'll be a sign. It'll be a wonder. It'll be a miracle. It will come to pass. May that be a word for you. You can say that. No matter what's happening around you, just relax. Take a break. And just say, I'm a person in the wind. Can you do that? Just do this. Just cross your arms like this. Say, I'm a person in the wind. Just shake it. I'm a person in the wind. I'm waiting for the blessing to manifest. I'm waiting for that promise to manifest. You're a person in waiting. He says, though it tarries, wait for it. Because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Second Peter 3 verse 19 tells us that the Lord God is not slack in His promises. He is not slack concerning His promises. He doesn't forget His promises. Yes, people will promise and they have a tendency to forget. Yes. But don't bring God to the level of a mere man, of a mere human. Because God is not a man that he should lie. Some of us brothers, we promised our wives. That we'll climb that highest mountain, swim that deepest ocean. We've never even been to the pool for them yet. Nor have we even been to a little hill for them. But we promised them all that. Don't feel bad. Hallelujah. I was watching, I might not get that. I'm joking. I'm only joking. But this is what I'm saying is that man will promise you. You forget. You cannot perform his promises. When God, listen, when God promises you something, you know, the Bible says, though the works were finished from the, at the beginning, from the foundation, what God has promised, He promises you what He's already done. God tells you what He's done already, not something that He's still going to do. It's done, it's set. Now you've got to walk in light of what God has done, in light of what God has said. And when God has said it, you write it down. God said it, I get it. God said it, I get it. I write it down. Hallelujah. Amen. So you've got to be a writer. Write it down. Let me go with you quickly to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy 1. I'm getting something to do. I know that. First Timothy chapter one. Watch this. First Timothy one, verse eighteen. Paul says, "This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning." This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. See that? In other words, Timothy, there is word that God has given concerning your life. And I charge you, take this word, so that as you take this word, by this word, you will wage a good warfare. Listen, you, we as believers are at war. We're constantly at war. You are in a battle. You are in a battle. When you read the book of Kings, the book of Chronicles, you see how the nation of Israel had to fight their way in. God gave them the promise. He told him about the land of milk and honey, but it did not come easy. There was a shorter way to 
see the promised land. But the Bible says God took a long way to teach him that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Amen. He took them the long way to see what was in their heart. It's, it's, come on, it's also revealing to you what you are capable of. I mean, look at your life. Look at your life. If you just visit quickly the sands of time in your life, how many times God brought you out? And every time God brought you out, He brought you into something better. He brought you out, He brought you into something better. You are in a fight for that future, in a fight for that destiny. But you cannot give up. God has given word concerning your life. You want to take those words. That's what He's telling Timothy. Take the prophecies, Timothy, and wage a good faith, a, a, a good war. Because as you take the word and you start speaking it, you're speaking God, you're speaking God to your situation. You're saying, I don't care what you're saying to me. Everything that I see, it is a mirage. The things that are seen, they are temporal, they are subject to change. But the things that are unseen are eternal. That means I have an eternal future. I have an eternal destiny. So I'm not moved by what I see. I'm not moved by what I hear. I'm not moved by what I can feel. We were all once people of the flesh, going by our senses. You know, I asked a question yesterday, after, sharing, after sending out the text that we sent yesterday. And I asked a question to the Lord. I said, Lord, why do people hurt so much? And God told me, because they have a sense nature. They are ruled by their senses. That's why. What are your senses? Your senses are your feelings. Because somebody has hurt your feelings, you become bitter. Somebody has said something or done something, and it has hurt you. No. When you move by the Spirit, the Spirit is bigger than the senses. Means they can say what they want to say, they can do what they want to do, it will not harm me, it will not hurt me, I am free. Because I know who I am in Christ. He has set me free. He endured the pain that I should have experienced. He endured that pain. He took it on himself. All of that that I was supposed to go through, he enjoyed it. I mean, they spat on him. They beat him. He did nothing, yet they did all that to him. And you look in your life and you see how many times you've done nothing. And yet people have hurt you. But like a lamb before it shudders in silence, he opened not his mouth. He remained silent. Brothers and sisters in Christ, remain silent. Don't answer. God is your vindicator. God will speak for you. You don't need to fight. You have a God who fights for you. You don't need to say anything. You have a God who speaks for you. You don't need to do anything. You have a God who does for you exceedingly abundantly above all that you could ever imagine. Above all you could fathom, God can do it. That is living your life in complete rest. That even if someone were to come tell you something that somebody said about you, you'd actually laugh about it. You even go on your knees and you pray for that person and say, oh, I feel very sorry for you. And you intercede because you know that God will move on your behalf. Watch 2 Timothy 4, verse 9. I'm going to cut short. 2 Timothy 4, verse 9. Paul, the Apostle Paul, speaking to Timothy. 
He says, be diligent to come to me quickly. Be diligent. Be diligent to come to me quickly. For Demas has forsaken me. Having loved this present world and has departed for Thessalonica, Christus for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia, only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. You see, when you are moving in the spirit like I showed you, the account with Joshua, and I gave you that example, where when you are moving with faith, who is with you and who has left you does not matter anymore. You're looking at the vision. Paul understood his calling to ministry. Therefore, he could tell Timothy, I need that one because it's useful for this thing. God will connect to you the right people. You'll not have to look for it. He'll connect them to you. He'll show them to you. You won't be still second guessing and thinking, oh no, I need to do an ITC check on this person. I don't know if I can trust them. But when God shows you it, then come and talk to me. When God shows you it, it will come, it will come, it will come. When God showed Moses the tabernacle, he even spoke to Moses. He said, Behold, I have come on. I've anointed you read. I've anointed him. I've made him skillful. He's a skilled person. I put skill in him. God will show you the skill in people. That's why he could, he, he could say, get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. And Titus, I have sent to Ephesus. Watch here, I want you to highlight this. Bring the cloak that I left with Carpus and Troas when you come. The cloak, the covering, the garment, because it was probably getting cold. He says, bring that cloak that I left there. And the books. And the books. So Paul was a leader. And what God has shown you what God has called you to do, if it's business, get some good books on business and start reading. Whatever it is, get good books and start reading because as you do that, you are growing yourself. You are growing yourself. Speak to successful business people. Speak to successful business people and find out how did they make it. Find out how did you know what? As they share their story with you, what they begin to share with you becomes a chronic, it, it's actually the chronicle of their lives. As they share the chronicles of their lives with you, you begin to learn from the mistakes that they made. That you don't make the same mistakes. And you become sharper. As I am sharpened, I am. So does the friend sharpen the countenance of his friend. You're going to be sharp. I mean, you're going to be razor sharp. Bring the books. You want to be a reader? Come and talk to me sometime. If it's carpentry, look at books and see. Look for ideas. If it's construction, look and see, get ideas. Whatever it is that God has called you to, whatever it is. Get books, start reading. And then Paul says this, he says, and the books. Double underline this, highlight this, especially the parchments. Especially the parchments. The New Living Translation says, especially my papers. Especially my papers. The message says, my notebooks. So Paul was one who would make notes. Hence you see, he was a writer. Hallelujah. He was a writer. And understand this, 
Before that, the preceding verses, Paul speaks of who has left him and who has abandoned him and how he has sent the one to go minister there. He was a resourceful person. Hallelujah. You are a resourceful person. Come on, talk to me, somebody. You are a resourceful person. It doesn't matter what you have. You will get by with anything that you have. Because God has given you a vision. God has given you a word that is bigger than where you act. You see, and then he says, especially my notebooks. Why? Because through reading his notes, through reading his notes, what he had written, he had, he could get strength to run. That he may, he may run who reads it. You see that? Hence, write it down. In other words, try and invest in a, you know, people would call it a diary. Call it a spiritual diary if you want. Where daily you write down what God is saying to you. Daily you write down what God is saying to you. What is God saying to your spirit? What has God said to you yesterday? Did you write it down when you forgot already? See, that that's why you've got to write it down. You know the things you trust God for. Even keep a prayer journal. A prayer journal. Make a list of the things that you're trusting God for. I've seen it in my own life. How often times I prayed and God answered long before. You know, I was expecting it then, but God answers before. And even when I look at the list, I have a specific order. But you know what God's order was? The thing that, was, that I kind of put at the bottom because I thought it was the most difficult, God brought it up. You understand? That even when I pray now, I can look at that prayer list. I can look at that list. And as God answers, you cross out. And when you see how God has answered you, then you've got faith now to ask Him for it gives you faith to trust Him for more. It gives you faith to come to Him in confidence because He'll answer your prayers. He's a prayer answering God. Amen. Hallelujah. You see, the more you read it, the more you believe it. And then you begin to believe what you've written. And then like David, who wrote Psalms, you start writing Psalms. I mean, look at your, when last, this is my question to you, David, David wrote in the Psalms, he wrote about God, his creator, who the creator created him to be, and who the creator was to him, and what the creator did through him and did in him. David had accounts of that. David was writing, what have you written? You know, when you meet someone for the first time, and you know, I think nowadays, I think that, uh, uh, really, that's why I really miss pen and paper. Because everything digital, even the text that the people send, it's, it's the short text, and the stone. Back in the day, you know, people would write like letters. Come on, people were creative, they'd write letters. Have you ever written a letter to God? Have you ever in your life written a letter to God? Just say, dear Lord, as you would to a friend. You know, just dear Lord. And just allow your spirit to start speaking. You'll be amazed at what your people are doing so big. You'll be amazed. You'll be amazed. Because now as you're writing, you start writing things that God has done for you, things you're trusting God to do. It's, it's amazing. It's amazing. You may say, but Pastor, where do I start? Just start. Just start with dear Lord. That's all. Amen. After that, the Holy Spirit will start taking you. You see? Because you're writing in the Spirit. You see, you're writing in the Spirit. And when you start speaking and praying it, it's all in the Spirit. You see, the Bible in the beginning, in Genesis, the Bible says the earth was without form. But the Spirit of God moved from the face of the waters. And God began to speak. And as God spoke, the Spirit moved. Therefore, 
The Holy Spirit is ready to do something in your life. He's your partner. He's your helper. He's your partner and your helper. The angels of God are waiting for a word from you so that they can minister on your behalf. Oh, Jesus. Come and talk to me, somebody. Hallelujah. Praise God. So begin to see yourself the way God sees you. Begin to speak about yourself the way God speaks about you. You are the righteousness of God created in Christ Jesus unto good works. You have been come and saved, healed, delivered. To put it simply, you have become a giant in life. See yourself as a giant. See yourself as a giant. A giant in your academics. A giant, come on, talk to me. In your, if it's in business, a giant in business. In your career, see yourself as a giant in that field. Begin to see yourself there. Come on, talk to me. See yourself as a giant in sewing, in fire. Come on, in sewing. Don't say, you know, one day when things come right, I'm going to sow like this and I'll do like this for God. No. God said, listen, I see it in the end. I caught myself that, which God has shown me. You must begin to speak that way. Say, I'm a radical sower. I'm a Regardless of what I'm doing, yes, I'm moving towards it. But I'm speaking into existence. Every time I say one day, let me tell you, you're going to stay by that story where it's one day, one day, one day. That day will never come. It's the same like the ladies that buy the Chinese tea set that is there in the cabinet on the display and they teach the children this lie that, you know, no, you can't drink tea from those cups. Those are for the visitors when they come. How many visitors have come and gone? Those things are still there gathering dust. Sometimes you may take it off and wipe it and just put it back on this plate and the child thinks, oh, I'll never get to drink from that cup. Because we're waiting for the visitors. And every time the visitors come, you'll find the child who says, Hi, Mom, remember those cups? Oh, don't, 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 those are for the special visitors. Those visitors don't come. You see, because that is the mentality you have. Is that one day when God blesses me like this, I'll do like this, I'll do like that. No, God has blessed me already. God has blessed me already. Oh, Jesus, God has blessed me already. I am the seed of Abraham. I'm an heir of the promise that was given to my father, Abraham. Are you hearing me, somebody? In Christ Jesus, the blessing that was upon Abraham has come upon me. I'm a descendant of Abraham. I'm an heir of that same promise. I see myself in the light of what God has said concerning God and Abraham. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. So writing down, ladies and gentlemen, awakens your consciousness to who you are. Writing down awakens your consciousness to who you are, who created you, who your creator is to you, what he has called you to do, and what you can do with him by your side. That's why you've got to write it down. Pen it down. Amen. David wrote whom God was to him. He wrote whom God was to him. When last did you write whom God is to you? When last did you write who God is to you? Write it down. Amen. Come on, somebody. You see, today, this is what I see. Even if it means after church. Listen, it may sound like foolishness. It may sound like foolishness. But it makes sense to the spirit man, it makes sense. My spirit man is awakened. So maybe today, go and invest, get yourself
yourself a, a notebook. You don't have to get an expensive diary. No, just get a notebook. And when you get that notebook, you see that's blank and there's all the pages. And that notebook, you give it a title. You call it whatever you want. Call it the Chronicle of Dolly, the Chronicle of Jeffrey, the Chronicle of Lucy, the Chronicle of Rodman, the Chronicle of, the Chronicle of Stacey, like M. Holmes, oh, the Chronicle, you know, the Chronicle of the Ness of Robert. Put, put your name there, the Chronicle of Sunny, put your name there. What is a chronicle? A chronicle is a factual written account of important or historical events in the order of their occurrence. You see, so now you're going to write down the facts. Not what I'm seeing here. Factually, what God is telling you, the truth. I'm writing that down. Day by day, begin to write down. Begin to write down. It is a record of a series of events in a factual and a detailed way. Maybe God impresses on your heart to buy a new home. What about that new home? What about that new home? The Bible says, whatsoever we ask in his name, according to his will, he will give it to us. But the thing is, God says, yes, you're asking me for a home. Tell me about the home. You can tell your friends about the home. You can show your friends the pictures of the home. How about you putting it on paper? This is your chronicle with God, your story with God. Tell God how many bedrooms. Be detailed, be specific. Where must the house be? Which tree? What type of neighbors you want? Okay. Very important because sometimes you see it, woo, you move, and woo, you get there. Listen, you bought it, there's a bond, you bound to it for 20 long years. So you ask God all that, ask detail. It could be you're trusting God for a business. What business? Where about? Come on, a job. Where about? What type? Be specific. You want to go study? Yes, you want to study. Where? What? How? You understand? This is your... Listen, as you do that, you are saying that yes, I'm done with the old. I've got a new leaf now. I've got a new book now to write. I've got a new story to write because there's a new author. It's no more the world. It's no more society. It's no more people. It's now God because Abraham looked for a city whose wonder and maker was God. I am looking for that city. I'm a resident of that city. Come on, talk to me. I am from Mount Zion, holy Mount Zion. I'm an inhabitant of Mount Zion. The Bible says those who dwell in there will not say, I am sick. He has said, I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you, so that we might boldly say, the Lord is my helper, the Lord is my strength. I will not fear what man will do to me. Hallelujah. Praise God. I know you've got something today. I know you've got something today. Start writing, start writing, start writing. You'll be amazed. Really, you'll be amazed. And that is what God wants, fellowship with us. It's not just about, you know, you read your Bible and pray, but also speaking to God and, you know, putting down on paper what God is speaking. So that when you go through life, you go through challenges like Paul, you can go for your parchments, go for your notebooks, and you can start reading. Man, I've got so many notebooks, some are finished and they put away somewhere. Now and then I look and I see, oh God said this. Oh yes, Lord, you said this. God, you said that. I mean, if you want, you can put dates to. God said it then. And look at it. It came to pass. And look. Make your life. Listen, this, this life of serving God and walking with God, it's an exciting one. 
It's one to be desired more than rubies and anything the world can give. There's nothing that can satisfy you more than that. As you're walking with him and having fellowship with him. Amen. Praise God. Somebody say, I'm going to write my story today. I'm going to write my story today. Amen. Come on, I'm going to write my story today. You know, even your children, what it is you trust in God. Write about your children. You know what that does. You know, you may not, uh, it may, may be nonsensical to you now. But listen, one day, your children's children, what will it mean to your children's children's children when they can pick up the book and say the chronicle of Rambam? Who was Rambam? And then they begin to say, hey, you know who Rambam was, you know who Denise was. And they start explaining, and the person starts reading, and they see, wow, what God did in my Great grandmother's life and my grandmother's life and my mother's life, God is going to do in my life too. That he may run who reads it. Because it gives them a form of being. I get it. I know who I am. Because listen, not many in your family may be born again in serving the Lord, but you are. You and families have a tendency to take on a belief system. We all die at 45. We all get heart sickness at that age, or we get that sickness, or we've got that, or we've got that. It's hereditary. No. No. I'm not in a generational curse. I'm in a generational blessing. You understand, as much as there's a generational curse, there's a generational blessing. When does a generation begin and when does it change? When the genes change. The genes change. So your genes change. The day you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you step over, you cross over from generational curse to generational blessing. There is life beyond the cross, and that is the life that you have. It's a life where you slay giants, not where you run away from giants, and not where you be still before the giant, but you can speak to the mountain, and you can say, be removed into the sea. That is the generation that you are from. So when, when everybody else is telling your great-great-grandchildren that this is what has happened in the family, they pick up that chronicle, and they say, no, 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 no. You've been saying that, but what I need you about my great-grandmother is not what you're saying. I know I want the God that my great-grandmother served. That's the God I want, and that's the one I'm serving. Oh, Jesus. Oh, I think I'm in the wrong place here. Come on, somebody. Did you get that? Did you get that? Write it down. Make a plane on tablets that he may run who reads it. Amen. Come on, let us stand. Let's thank God. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. 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 Hallelujah. You see, maybe it's even the things that you're facing in your life. If it's healing, man, there are thousands of scriptures here concerning healing. Go to those scriptures and start writing them down, chronicle them, write them down. You see, God, by His Spirit, inspired holy men of old to write His Word. So that we can have something to read, something to give us life, something to give us a picture of who we really are, why He created us, and who He created us to be. And as we 
me read it. The same spirit which wrote these scriptures writes it on the tablets of our heart. That's why Paul could say we have the same spirit of faith that David had. The same spirit of faith according to what is written. I believe and therefore I speak. We too believe. It means that as I read, I believe this also to be true concerning my life. And I speak what I believe. I'm not speaking what I read in the newspaper. I'm not speaking what I saw on the television. I was watching a documentary on Dr. Lester Sumner, a man of God. We had the pleasure of meeting Smith Wigglesworth. He said his first visit to Smith Wigglesworth's house. He had a newspaper wrapped under his arm. He knocked on the door. And when Smith Wigglesworth opened the door, Smith Wigglesworth's first question to him is, what's that under your arm? He said he had a very funny way of speaking. So he had to, you know, because of the accident. And he said, it's a newspaper. He said, you leave it outside. It doesn't come in my house. That's lies. I don't allow lies in my house. And then we wonder why Smith's Wiggles would walk in such power. Because he allowed no other word to speak about his life except the word.
Amen. If you walk to your workplace tomorrow, you just have that mentality. Well, tomorrow's a holiday or Tuesday, whenever. You go to your workplace, your business, wherever it is. Even if it's at school, you say, the old me is gone, forgotten. The new me has now come. It's the new me in Christ. You see, you've got to get that mentality. You know, I ministered the word of crossing the Red Sea. I think about two years ago. And I didn't know that my son Joshua actually took it. Until he said to me one day, he said, you know, Dad, you ministered on that. And I took that word. Because every time, he'd always come second, second, second. There was this girl in front of him. And he said, you preached on the sea, and that girl is my sea. And I trust God that God opened it. He opens the sea. And God did. From that time, every time, Joshua is the Last year he became head boy in his school. And then what? Two weeks ago, we were invited to a prize giving they had for last year. They didn't have it last year because of the lockdowns. So they had it this year. And we were sitting there and they called him the names of all the learners. And Joshua was one of two. There were two of them. In both the English and Afrikaans medium in the school. In his grave. He was one of the two. There were only two who had straight A's. And Joshua took all the awards. He was the dance for last year. And he praised God. I looked at that and I began to think and I said, Lord, this child took you by faith. He said that you can open the Red Sea. You can remove the obstacle in front of him. And you can make but you did that for him. I learned through his small testimony. I learned to also take that step of faith. So I'm not going to let the obstacles dictate to me what I can and cannot do. I have a God who can do more than enough. Come on, somebody. God can do it. Our children are amazing. So be, be renewed today, be refreshed, be restored, be made whole, be made complete. Be well in your mind, be well in your body, be well in your spirit. May the Lord give you that song in your spirit. Which says, it is well, it is well, it is well with my soul. Oh, be still and know that I am God. May the Lord God remember you this day. May He cause people to remember you. People that have borrowed stuff from you a long time ago. And you were better about it. Become better about it and just laugh about it. <laughs> you know what? Just laugh about it because he who is seated in heaven laughs. And you know why I'm laughing? It's because the one you least expected to remember God will cause them to remember. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, this is an awesome God we serve. Father, we just thank you this morning for your word. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your goodness. For your love. For your compassion. Thank you for your faithfulness, oh God. You've been faithful, Lord, of all the years. Time after time after time, you've 
been faithful. For you are faithful, you are true. And to worship your God, we live, we live to worship. Our lives belong not unto us, O God, but to you. Thank you, Lord, that our citizenship is not in this world, it is not of this world, but our citizenship is in heaven. Grow in the knowledge 
knowledge of Him, the knowledge of His words. In Jesus' wonderful name, the Lord bless you, cause His face to shine upon you, grant you great success, sweatless victories. In Jesus' wonderful name, and the people of God say, Amen.